Good morning and welcome to a critical conversation on race and COVID-19. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, former nine-term member of Congress. Behind me virtually is the Wilson Center, which is actually open to staff, physically open to staff, but our programs are virtual. And I was just explaining to our guests that we are attracting thousands of viewers and listeners and, and thank you for joining. Uh, also, thank you for wanting to have, to be a part of serious conversation at a time when uh, 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 many are just totally distracted by this terrible pandemic uh, that is uh, everywhere in the world and certainly in the United States where I am. Uh, today we are joined by Congresswoman Alma Adams, a Democrat from North Carolina's 12th district, who will share her insights on how women are put at risk by essential, by essential work, gender-based violence, and greater vulnerability to COVID-19 among women of color. Let me try that again. It's a trifecta. Uh, women are essential workers. Uh, there is gender-based violence at home, something we've covered in prior sessions. And uh, women of color are more vulnerable to COVID-19. In fact, people of color uh, are more vulnerable to COVID-19 as the statistics are showing. So uh, let me make these points briefly before I introduce uh, Congresswoman Adams. Uh, women and girls are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 because women are more likely than men to work in social sectors or healthcare settings where face-to-face -face interactions are required. That's one point. 70% of the health workforce is female. Uh, over 70% of global caregiving hours are given by women and girls. In the US in April alone, we're now in July, but the stats aren't any better, women accounted for 55% of the increase in job losses and the unemployment rate for women went from 3.1% to 15%. Also in April, uh, UN Secretary uh, Antonio Guterres called for a global ceasefire in the surge in gender-based violence. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many of these uh, conversations I've moderated in horror listening to the statistics around the world in gender-based violence. Um, finally, the UN, uh, the UN Population Fund predicts that for every three months of lockdown, there will be an additional 15 million cases of gender-based violence. So that's one point. Second point, COVID-19 also disproportionately impacts people of color. According to a recent New York Times study using CDC data, Latino and African-American United States residents have been three times as likely to be infected uh, with COVID-19 as their white neighbors. And black and Latino, blacks and Latinos have been nearly twice as likely to die from the virus uh, as others. Um, so after this grim, horrible <laughs> set of statistics, we're delighted to have an optimistic artist whose name is Alma Adams joining us to discuss these issues and her work, her serious work on women's health. She's in her third term uh, in the House representing North Carolina's 12th district, which is based in Charlotte. She is also co-chair of the Black Maternal Health Caucus and a member of the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls, as well as the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issue, which is a very productive caucus. Uh, she has introduced and co-sponsored a wide variety of legislation addressing maternal health care in the United States and abroad. Alas, we did not overlap in Congress, but I follow her, her activity with interest, and we are really delighted and honored that she's joining us for a conversation today at the Wilson Center. To moderate that conversation is our very own Sarah Barnes, who directs our maternal health initiative and has presided over a number of conferences on this topic, including gender-based violence, and who also serves as our women and gender advisor. Special thanks to you, Sarah, uh, and to your team for their hard work and excellent programming in difficult times. So now please join me in welcoming Sarah Barnes and Alma Adams for what I, what I know will be a very interesting conversation. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Harmon, for that kind introduction and for setting the stage for today's conversation with Congresswoman Alma Adams on COVID-19, women and race. 
As Jane noted, and the world is becoming increasingly aware, COVID-19 is having a devastating effect on the world's women and girls. Uh, as also was noted, today's event is focused on three facets of that devastation. First, the increased unemployment and caregiving responsibilities. Second, looking at devastating racial disparities in access and quality of healthcare services and treatment during the pandemic. And then in the United States, the disproportionate number of infections and deaths in black and brown communities as well. And third, the rise of gender-based violence around the world. So women are, yes, being devastatingly affected on a multitude of levels. While at the same time, women have also been revered as top leaders as countries tackle the pandemic and characteristics of female leaders like being collaborative, good listeners and compassionate have made positive impacts on politics and foreign policy conversations globally. Today, I am honored to speak with one such leader, Congresswoman Alma Adams, about the role of Congress in tackling these challenging issues as well as a view into her personal leadership and expertise. Jane already started the introductions of Congresswoman Adams, but I'll just add a little bit here. Dr. Alma Adams is the representative for the 12th Congressional District of North Carolina. Um, and she is also, as was noted, she's a representative on the Committee of Financial Services, Committee on Education and Labor, and the Committee on Agriculture. She's a chairwoman on the Committee of Education and Labor Subcommittee. She is a co-founder of the Black Maternal Health Caucus and founder and co-chair of the Congressional Bipartisan Historical Black Colleges and University Caucus. She is also a part of the Women's Caucus, the Diabetes Caucus, Autism Caucus, Congressional Black Caucus, Progressive Education Caucus, Historic Preservation Caucus, AIDS and H HIV Caucus, Hunger Caucus, Medicaid Expansion Caucus, and the Art Caucus. So I could go on and on, as I'm sure you can all imagine. Um, but we have a lot to cover today on the implications of COVID-19 on women and race. And I would like to thank all of you who are watching today for being here and for sending questions ahead of time. We will definitely dive into Q&A um, after Congresswoman's opening remarks. So now it is with great pleasure that I open the floor to you, Congresswoman Adams, for your opening remarks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for that kind introduction. I am delighted to be a part of this important conversation on women and COVID-19. I also want to thank uh, the Congresswoman Jane Harmon, the Wilson Center, the Maternal Health Initiative for hosting and inviting me to join you today. Uh, this conversation is about gender, racial disparities, and it could not be more timely uh, as our nation grapples with unprecedented public health crisis and the recent incidences of, of racial violence and police brutality. We're still reeling from the heartbreaking murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Elijah McCain, and countless others due to systemic racism that's still pervasive in America. But as has been said, I'm optimistic and I'm feeling hopeful for the first time in a long time that we can continue uh, to make the progress toward racial justice and address the, uh, the darkest legacy uh, of our country and the impacts that we uh, will all experience to this day. Now you already know this, but COVID-19, uh, this era has been an especially trying time for our country. We're feeling the impact in each and every community. And in particular though, the statistic tell, tells us that women and people of color are bearing the brunt of it. COVID-19 has revealed what the black community and communities of color have known for a long time. Health outcomes are further compounded by systemic and structural racism. COVID-19 has exposed that women have, what, what, what women have known uh, for a long time, gender inequality exists, it threatens economic empowerment, and it increases vulnerabilities. The pandemic has shown us in the starkest terms how wide the gaps are in health outcomes between black and white America and between men and women. Racial gender disparities are further exacerbated by this current pandemic. Now, minorities have been experiencing higher rates of infection, death, particularly African-Americans. In Louisiana, for example, Blacks account for 70% of the deaths, but only 33% of the population. In Alabama, uh, they account for 44% of the deaths and 26% of the population. And in Chicago, 72% of deaths have been black persons while making, while, 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 while have been African-Americans, while we make up less than a third of the city's population. So when we look at the numbers, 
we must be uh, we must remember that our immigrant community, because of the current administration's immigration stance, has made them fearful about coming forward, even due to illness. So we don't know the actual number for this demographic group. So during our conversation today, I am really grateful that we'll focus specifically on what's happening to women during this pandemic, unprecedented unemployment rates, loss of support systems for working mothers like childcare and school, summer camps, increased gender-based and, and intimate partner violence, maternal health disparities, and decreased access to, to care, uh, disproportionate uh, burdens of caregiving, and on the front lines, overrepresented in essential services and increased exposure to the virus, wage inequality, widening of the gender pay gap. And I could go on and on, but let me just spend a moment on an issue that I've been fighting for in Congress, one of the major public health crises of our time, that is black maternal health. The United States is of only 13 countries in the world where the rate of maternal mortality is now worse than it was 25 years ago. And the significant health disparities that black mothers and, and infants face are exacerbated by this COVID-19. So for me, the issue uh, is deeply personal. My focus on black maternal health began when my daughter survived a complicated pregnancy that almost claimed her life. So I knew that when I got to Congress, I had to make this a priority. In 2018, Senator Kamala Harris and I worked with the Black Mamas uh, Matter uh, Alliance to introduce resolutions honoring the first Black Maternal Health Week as the Maternal Care Act. And that effort led uh, last April to Congresswoman Underwood and I uh, launching the Black Maternal Health Caucus. So because we wanted to raise awareness, to educate our colleagues, and to shine a spotlight on the maternal health crisis, that mothers are dying needlessly during what should be one of the most joyous times of their lives. This caucus has now grown to more than 100 members in, in less than a year, men and women. And it speaks to the importance of this issue and how it resonates so deeply with, with Congress across party lines. So we, it's, it's bi, bipartisan. And the main goal of the caucus is to develop and advance evidence-based policy solutions to the issues impacting maternal health. And I'm just, uh, again, delighted to talk about that and many of the other issues that, uh, that impact us. So thank you very much, uh, and I'm gonna yield back. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Adams, for the, your opening remarks. Um, and I'd like to continue the conversation looking at Black maternal health. So even before the COVID-19 pandemic, Black women in America are two, two and a half to four times more likely to die in childbirth than their white counterparts regardless of their socioeconomic status or education level. Some reports show even higher discrepancies. Ending preventable maternal mortality is central to both of our work. Um, and given the current state of COVID-19's disproportionate impact on black and brown communities, alongside protests around police brutality in the United States that has become a global movement, what opportunity do you see for Congress to address not only racial disparities in the United States, but also racial disparities in the U.S. health system, including in Black maternal health? So thank you for that question. You know, I see a, a tremendous opportunity for Congress and our society as well to pursue a transformational structural change because the system isn't working for so many people, especially women and minorities, and it, it really is time uh, to, to try to do something else. Uh, you know, I've been fighting all of my life against racism and gender inequality because Black women experience a double impact of these harmful systemic issues. So when it comes to maternal health, moms in America are more likely to die in childbirth than mothers in any other developed country. The United States has the highest maternal mortality rate among affluent co uh, countries because of the disproportionate death rate of Black mothers. And the Black maternal health in the co coronavirus era is truly a crisis within a crisis. So as you mentioned earlier, uh, black women, regardless of their educational level or their socioeconomic status, are nearly four times or more likely to die from preventable pregnancy-related complications than women of other races. Uh, black women in the US suffer from life-threatening pregnancy complications twice as often as white women. We're also uh, uh, seeing that black women experience higher rates of maternal uh, complications and infant mortality. They're three times, uh, they are three times more likely than white women 
to have fibroids and that can cause uh, postpartum hemorrhaging. And they're more than twice as likely to lose an infant to premature death. Uh, these are, are stark disparities and they haven't improved over the last six decades. But research does tell us that cumulative stress of racism and sexism undermines black women's health, making them more vulnerable to complications that endanger their lives and, and the lives of their infants. But I believe that we're experiencing a national reckoning. And in this unique moment, I definitely see an opportunity for Congress, but also for our local governments to enact policies that begin to address our country's greatest ills. Now, I had the privilege of serving in local and state government, so I know that things can happen there. And I'm proud to support bills like uh, the Justice and Policing Act that we just passed out, out of the House, the Black Maternal Health Omnibus, the, 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 um, the Health Equity and, and, and Accountability Act, and Medicare for All, just to name a few. But so the, the, the caucus, my caucus has been working hard to present a vision of, of a more equitable world in which healthcare is considered a human right, uh, because I believe it is a human right. And we strive to, to root out bias and inequality uh, from our systems. I think that's what we really have to do. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> Thank you. Jane, did you have a question? Here we go. Um, Thank you very much, Alma. That was uh, fascinating. And you're, you're full of, of statistics on the topic. And that prompts my question. Well, two things. First, I want to say on the general subject of race that the Wilson Center appreciates the moment. We do. And we appreciate the complex history of Woodrow Wilson. So we are not missing that either. Uh, our board uh, passed a resolution uh, last week uh, endorsing a partnership between the Wilson Center and the race initiative of the Smithsonian Institution headed uh, by a man who obviously uh, has deep understanding of the topic. Uh, so we're doing that. But in addition to that, we have a diversity and inclusion council at the Wilson Center. And we are determined to do as well as we can, both in terms of creating the right environment inside that, that really does uh, uh, a fight against any form of racial injustice, and especially injustice against our, our Black uh, staff members, but also recruits in a better way than we have, not that we haven't tried, but better, uh, from uh, the Black and other minority communities, because there's talent everywhere, as we all know. My mm -hmm. question is this, you're full of statistics, and you said that what we need is evidence-based solutions. In an era of fake news, where everybody brings his or her own facts. How do you get people to believe the evidence that, uh, that you are citing uh, around these topics? Well, uh, thank you for your, and listen, I am so uh, grateful for all that you're doing at the Wilson Center and certainly those initiatives are gonna be very helpful. Uh, and uh, you set wonderful examples for the rest of, rest of our nation. Um, you know, I think it's, um, there's so, there's so many conflicts out here right now um, that I, I'm going to always go with the experts. Now, we've done a lot of research uh, through uh, my caucus and through my personal work and the work in my office, uh, but I think we have, we have national experts uh, who I believe um, we need to truly listen to. Now, how do you get people to do that? I think we've got to get like-minded folk who believe as I do and you do, uh, that um, we have got to get our arms around this situation. And the only way we can do it, uh, you know, I listen to the news every day and I was listening this morning and uh, I was listening to um, uh, Dr. Fauci uh, talk about the dire situation that we're in. Uh, we're even finding that uh, some people who didn't want to do the things that the CDC has, uh, has mentioned, wearing masks, social distancing, and all those things. I think they're beginning to come around. Why? Because uh, the numbers are, are, are going extremely high in places. The, the, the beds in the hospitals are filling up. So uh, I think it's going to take a continuous discussion, but I think we're going to have to uh, really insist that people begin to listen to uh, the experts and the folks who really can bring that hard data, because it's out there. And um, we just have to get people believing. And it's, it's unfortunate 
uh, that sometimes things have to get so bad. You know, it's kind of like living in a community and you know you need to stop right there, uh, but so many people get killed before they actually put one up. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we're at this point now uh, where we're going to have to turn people around and we're going to have to really rely on our experts and all of us will have to work together uh, to make sure that that word um, continues to get out. We got to keep talking about it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And I, I know I saw this morning that it was something around 250,000 new cases absolutely. in um, the U.S. over the last five days. So I'm hoping people will start listening. Um, so we're going to make a hard turn um, from the health to look more at um, unemployment for women. Um, as we know, you know, the double, triple burden that women face. Women are faced with increased unemployment, even more unemployment than men in the United States right now. Um, but we also have increased caregiving responsibilities. Um, can you speak to COVID-19's impact on women's economic empowerment and workforce protection in the United States? Well, thank you. You know, um, since the start of the pandemic, uh, we've had more than 42 million Americans filing for unemployment. Uh, and when you look at that, um, uh, we've got currently now more than 20 million Americans in the labor market who remain unemployed, including one out of every six uh, black workers, nearly five out of, of every Hispanic worker. Uh, but women have been hit the hardest. Uh, by uh, job losses during this period. Black women, almost 17%, uh, Latinx women, uh, more than about 21%. Uh, they've been disproportionately affected. Uh, it's deeply concerning because the pandemic has completely wiped out the historic job gains that women have made over the past decade. And, you know, just a few months ago, women represented the majority uh, of the U.S. workforce. We're overrepresented in the most Im impacted industries, uh, leisure, leisure industries, hospitality, healthcare, education. Uh, and when you look at some of what we're calling the essential workers, they're women. Women as waitresses, daycare uh, providers, hairstylists, uh, hotel maids, dental hygienists, and so on and on. So although the, the June jobs report showed a positive reduction in women's unemployment, the recent wave of cases that seem to be spiking across the country will likely result in a second round of shutdowns. That's gonna further harm, and harm women. So uh, we, it took women longer than men to recover from the Great Recession uh, and the impact of COVID will likely uh, result in a, in a similar uh, uh, slow recovery for women. So the other reality is that many women in the workforce are also mothers and our working moms are facing an especially difficult time because they rely on schools and childcare, which are both closed. Uh, and you know, we've been talking in the women's caucus that that it's essential that we have childcare because if we're talking about getting the economy going and women going back to work, they can't do that and leave their children at home. Uh, so mothers are facing uh, an impossible decision: choose between a job or my children. Uh, and so we're seeing many women, women who are unable to go back to work. And on top of that we continue to experience an, an over-increasing wage gap. I worked on this wage gap for a number of years, but despite 41% of mothers being, being the primary breadwinners for their family, they continue to face the wage inequality. Now that really doesn't make sense. They're doing the providing, yet they're not getting the income. If you think about it, more than four in five black mothers, that's like 81% are breadwinners. The majority of, of uh, these mothers are raising families on their own. So two and three uh, uh, Native American mothers are breadwinners. So we deserve equal pay for equal work. You know, working hard is not enough if you don't make enough. So I'm a co-sponsor proudly of the Paycheck Fairness Act, a big proponent of raising the, 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 the wage. I did that all in North Carolina as well. But, but both of these bills originated in the Education and Labor Subcommittee on Workforce Protections, which I chair and I uh, help to get them across the finish line. So, uh, you know, if we look at the, the wage and wage gap, we could benefit our working women if we would increase that wage. So uh, workforce protections, uh, we've led uh, in a number of areas here. And we know that swift action wasn't taken, if, if, if swift action wasn't taken, then we'd be um, uh, failing our frontline healthcare workers because we make up, women do, 52% of essential workers non-white women are more likely to be doing essential jobs than anybody else. So the work that they do has often been underpaid, undervalued, 
and, and, and an unseen labor force that keeps the country running. So, um, you know, it's really important that we continue to identify ways to support women and ensure uh, that they weather this crisis because we are on the front lines and uh, we must be supported. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think we can also learn from, you know, past pandemics like Ebola really showed that yeah. women took much longer to be able to recover financially, economically after the pandemic. And also, and this leads into my next question, we also learned from Ebola that there was an increase um, in gender-based violence during that time. And we are finding that from the offset of the COVID-19 pandemic, that there has been an increase in gender-based violence around the world. Um, as Jane mentioned, that UNFPA predicted that for every three months of lockdown, there will be an additional 15 million cases of gender-based violence. Um, I mean, that's astounding to me. Um, and predominantly, we're seeing news on the rise of intimate partner violence, or as some people would call domestic violence. But there's also been reporting of a rise in things like child marriage, marriage, um, sexual exploit exploitation of women and girls and other harmful practices. Um, can you speak to the issue of gender-based violence and the role of Congress in addressing this issue? Yes, thank you very much. You know, there's some things uh, we, we talk a lot about um, uh, Congress and uh, the fact that uh, we can't get along and we, we can't agree on things. But there, I think there are many areas that we do agree on and that we do work together on. But you know, around the globe, uh, governments have, have implored uh, residents to, to stay home, to protect themselves and, and to protect others from this COVID-19. But for domestic violence victims, that means that the vast majority of women are, uh, a, 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 a majority are, of them are women and children. Uh, they are home sometimes in, in dangerous places. Uh, around the world, uh, one, of, one of every three women uh, has experienced physical or sexual violence at some point in their life. Now, these, there are communities across the US where laws are inadequate at protecting women from intimate partner violence and abuse. And I think that's why we need to really uh, implore our state governments to really be looking at these things uh, a little more carefully. But tragically, um, uh, uh, calls to domestic violence hotlines have been soaring over the past several months. Uh, and that suggests uh, certainly an increase in abuse, violence, and harm. And, and stay home orders uh, compounded uh, by increased unemployment, job loss, and you know, we're talking about stress and, and decreased space at domestic violence shelters. All of these things make an already unsafe situation much, much worse. So around the world, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in the demand for social services and assistance. You have people going to food banks who've never been before. Uh, meanwhile, you've got social health and legal service providers such as shelters and food banks, legal aid offices, child care centers, health care facilities, rape, rape crisis centers, they're overwhelmed and they at the same time are understaffed. So as a survivor myself of domestic violence, I know firsthand how important it is that we keep working to pass and strengthen legislation to improve services for survivors uh, like the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, I agree with the policies that are emphasized by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the United Nations that countries must incorporate a gender perspective in their response to COVID-19 crisis. So Congress is, is following this issue today. We're close and, and I believe that there's some steps that we must take, uh, including encouraging states to support the development of alternative reporting mechanisms, expanding shelter uh, uh, options, supporting independent women's groups, uh, supporting the capacity of the security and criminal justice sectors, maintaining uh, vital sexual and reproductive health services where domestic and, and, and sexual violence victims are often identified and supported, uh, financing economic security measures for women workers, especially those who are serving on the front lines of the pandemic or uh, in the informal economy and, and other groups uh, disproportionately affected by the pandemic, such as migrant workers, refugee, homeless, uh, and, and trans uh, women, and collecting comprehensive data 
on the, the, the gender impact of COVID-19. Data is increasingly important because, you know, sometimes as politicians, we tend to dismiss things, not move on to doing what we need, need to do. And because it's right to do, because we say, well, you, wh wh where's your proof? I mean, how do we know that? So, but uh, that's, um, that's um, you know, I think that this is an issue that we really need to stay on top of. Thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. I feel like we need another hour to dive into all of these really important topics. We'll have to have you back another time at the well, Wilson Center. Wonderful. But as we prepare to close, um, do you have any final comments on any steps Congress is taking to address these issues or policies that are currently being introduced to address the gender and racial disparities um, illuminated by COVID-19? Any last thoughts for us today? Well, let me just say that Congress has been over the past year and a half uh, taken hundreds of steps to address the issues. Unfortunately, the Senate's holding up a, more than 300 bills, 80% of those uh, we've passed out of the House and, and over 200 of those bills have actually passed with Republican support. So they're bipartisan, uh, but crucial uh, bills that will help us begin to address racial bias and law enforcement, um, as well as uh, uh, to provide paid family and medical leave, like the Family Act, you really need, you really need to do that. Uh, but most recently, though, the House passed the Heroes Act, which is a, a robust, bold, uh, compassionate investment in American people. And we must invest in our people. But despite the spin coming out of, of the White House sometimes from uh, some of my colleagues, this pandemic is, is not over. It's far from being over. And so people desperately need relief. And so our work's not done. We need to get out uh, more stimulus uh, checks. We need to uh, enhance the unemployment benefits, access to food, rental, mortgage, and so forth. But I particularly um, uh, want to uh, just uh, mention the uh, ongoing efforts to address maternal health disparities. In March, uh, I joined my caucus co-chair, uh, Representative Lauren Underwood, and Senator Harris to unveil the historic comprehensive package that we call the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Bill. And it's a, a momnibus bill that builds upon existing maternal health legislation. And it fills in a lot of the gaps and we've got nine bills that do that uh, to comprehensively address the Black maternal health crisis. And it makes investments in training providers and professionals to screen for social determinants of health, including environmental risk. It helps to diversify our uh, perinatal workforce, it invests in, in doulas and midwives and so forth. So uh, it invests in telehealth services. And you know, in this age now, that's gonna be important. Digital tools, increased data and so forth. But in addition to those efforts to improve black maternal health outcomes, the Momnibus also focuses on high risk populations, including uh, women who, uh, veterans, incarcerated women, Native Americans, because we've got to be inclusive in this process. COVID has no, it does not discriminate against who you are, where you live, uh, what your gender, what your ethnicity is, all of those things, as far as COVID is concerned, uh, will, will be impacting all those people. So we're going to address uh, these issues through the momnibus because it not only targets failures in the maternal health care system, but it also addresses pervasive maternal health disparities through solutions. I think we have to be solution oriented uh, as we move through this crisis. So there's a roadmap that's gonna help our healthcare system. That's what this is. Uh, and we've got to have, um, I think, a call to action. Uh, so, you know, we've got to continue to impact Congress. Uh, we've got to ensure that good legislation gets enacted. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've always continued to say, you, you don't change policy sometimes until you change policy makers or you must change their minds. Uh, so we've got to get people to be, be conscientious as we move into this next four months. Uh, uh, get out, protest. You know, protest can be a good thing. Write letters. That's a way of protesting as well. Make phone calls. And, and come November, we've got to get out and uh, uh, make our voices heard uh, in this election. Wonderful way to end. Thank you very much for your commentary, Congresswoman Adams, um, and for your optimism and for taking the time to speak with us today. I know how very busy you are. Um, and thank you also to Congresswoman Harmon for leading us off and to all of you watching online. Thank you very much for being here today and I hope you remain healthy and safe. Thank you very much and thank you. It's been a wonderful privilege to be with you.